Well, what kind of childhood was it? What kind of household did you grow up in? <laughs> well, there were, there was four of us, and uh, we lived in this huge bungalow on the top of a hill outside Bury in Lancashire. It was like a, a prefab on steroids, huge bungalow, <laughs> and it had been a children's holiday home for the poor children of Bury. They were so poor they had to have a holiday home in Bury. They couldn't afford to go. <laughs> It had only had about four rooms, but my mother had divided it into lots and like 20 little rooms and little bits of hardboard that she'd nicked off building sites. <laughs> so whenever, whenever you slammed the door, like three walls would fall down. Like, <laughs> we stood there like Buster Keaton in the middle. And we all had our own room and we all did our own thing. And like that, I watched television. My mo mother was in a big office full of wool. I don't know why she didn't do any knitting. She just had a room full of wool. And my father <laughs> was in an office typing and eating Thornton's toffee. You know, the sort you hit with a hammer. Yes. See, we made our own entertainments in those days. So you had these compartments? We had these compartments, And you were yeah. all quite separate? Oh, yeah, completely separate. Because nobody wanted to go in the living room because it had neon lights. You know, <laughs> like death row. So we didn't, you know, nobody wants to be in there. Was there no time you ever got together? I mean, I did you? There must have been, really. But if you think, the 1950s, things were much, you know, children had a very dull life. I mean, you were in a pram till you were two, looking at leaves, weren't you? In the <laughs> and then you stood by the front gate till you were five, with a bonnet on. And then, you know, suddenly you had a good spit wash and you were in a brick building with 47 other children. <laughs> How has this happened? Who are these? I've never seen any people my height. I thought it was the only child in Bury. I didn't realise there were others. <laughs> The fifties too were, were very boring, isn't it? The people who haven't lived through that period yeah, forget how boring. They never dull. knew how boring it was. It, it was, was very dull, it was grey, very time, grey. Wasn't it? it was very grey. I remember just being in a sort of big tarmac expanse of the playground, and playgrounds are horrible. People forget, you know, like when you were growing up, and like you have your hair cut. People say, "Oh no, 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 I like it. No, no, it's growing on me." Actually, and children say, "You've had your hair cut. You look really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to go to hell because you've had your hair cut." <laughs> Did, but was there any uh, idea of uh, sitting around the TV set, for instance? I mean, you had a TV set. We had a TV set, but we only rented it, so it went back in the summer. Oh. Because <laughs> my mother thought, you shouldn't watch TV in the summer. You should be out being molested. <laughs> <laughs> Which was easy to arrange, was because, <laughs> because where I live was crawling with perverts. I mean, we'd go to the pictures, and the pictures then wasn't like the pictures now. The pictures was like a hot, you know, there'd be a horrible, huge, filthy, damp Odeon, and there'd be like five children, about 35 perverts in a circle. <laughs> I don't know they got in cheap for what, I don't know, adults three bob, perverts two and six. But I saw, you know, things like The Greatest Story Ever Told, and Exodus, and Ben-Hur, all terrible films full of leprosy, people being nailed to crosses. <laughs> and you'd sit there, and the thing about the cinema then was you... You went in in the middle. You didn't go at the beginning of the film. You just went in whenever when you went in, and it was continuous. And you'd watch it to the end, and then you'd watch the middle. You'd watch the beginning to the middle. And you'd say, oh, that's why he's been nailed to a cross. That was Jesus. <laughs> But the one I remember most was Samson and Delilah, which was a uh, victim mature. And there's a bit where she's trying to get him to, she's trying to render him unconscious so that she can cut his hair off. I mean, she should have given him a bag of oven chips and sat him down in front of the antiques road show. That would have been the most and so she gives him this poison chalice, and the whole cinema, all these children went, Don't drink it, <laughs> Samson, don't drink it. It's a film, shut up. Well, how did the perfect means of escape from this dull, boring world? <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean, I, I like television more. I was obsessed with television, right. and it was always a disappointment when it went back to the shop yes. in the summer. But then we did buy one. My father bought one. Um, and so we could watch it all year round. Because I never, you know, if anything happened in the summer, I never saw it on the television. So did Ken and Deirdre get married? Oh, yeah, when was that? July. Oh, well, that's why I didn't see it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and one year, after he'd bought a set, I think it was when I was doing my O-levels, he, he'd obviously decided I was watching too much television, because I did watch it all the time. And instead of saying anything, so my father didn't like the confrontation, he wrapped it up in a Macintosh. <laughs> so, so I went in one day, and it was just it's like this big grey package with a belt round the middle. <laughs> And nobody said anything. I don't think I need to ask you where you get your inspiration <laughs> from for the <laughs> comedy. What about your mum in all this? Oh, because well, my mother, she was a different kettle of fish. She was quite, she could be quite scary. She was always like ripping up rhododendrons with her bare hands and <laughs> digging drainage ditches. And when she hoovered, it was her way of getting the paint off the skirting board. You know? <laughs> and she used to drive this little Austin van, a grey van, one of the metal sort, you know, with no windows at the back. And she was a terrible driver because she was shouting all the time. She was like, you silly man! She used to drive, you stupid one, what do you think you're doing? Actually, and you'd be thinking, oh, please don't, don't embarrass me. And she'd, she'd jam the brakes on when, it, when she went past the building, so, and then you'd hit your head on the windscreen, because there were no seat belts there. Like, no wonder I did badly at school, I was always concussed. And, um, <laughs> and she'd jam the brakes on, and she'd leap out, and she'd come up with a big lump of timber. Now, this'll come in handy, but she's never on your knee. And then, five minutes, she'd, jam, she'd go to a junk shop and come up with four dining chairs for two and six years. She'd like, the Cracker Jack was sitting all these things on your knee. <laughs> the one, she bought the whole, she bought the whole costumes from a production of The Merry Widow. <laughs> and there was, 
who have sat in a bag in the front hall for about 15 years. <laughs> and then the, the best thing she ever bought, she bought a sack of shoe lasts. Oh, you know, the wooden things for making yeah. shoes. There were 200 of them in this sack, wooden ones, all for the left foot. <laughs> um, and she had them in a shed for 30 years. And when, <laughs> I, when she moved, I went up to help her clear up her house, you see. And I went in, and my sister's sitting in the kitchen looking very helplessly at about 24 thermos flasks. Because <laughs> whatever my mother had, she had to have lots of it. And I went in the shed, and I, I actually found myself thinking, that could come in handy, you know, 200 left-footed shoe lasts. I might, and, no, no, put them in the skip. <laughs> she, was, uh, she left school at 14, and mm. then, she, then she, she taught herself, didn't she? She was mm. self-taught yeah. and became a teacher. So, I mean, yeah. plain a remarkable woman in many oh, senses. Oh, terribly, terribly clever. Yeah. That, that generation, of course, I mean, they, I suppose, did feel a touch frustrated if they were bright like your mother was, and the, there was no chance of going on to further education at all. Yeah, so she, had, she waited until I was 11, and then she went, she went back to college, and she did her O-levels and her O-levels, and she went to university, and then she got a PhD. She's very, very clever. Is she still alive? Yeah. What does she make of your of your success? I haven't told her. Yeah. <laughs>